With kids around, me time runs out fast. Don't waste valuable child-free minutes on a drink run. Instead, get Drizzly, the number one app for alcohol delivery. Drizzly has the largest selection of beer, wine, and spirits, delivered in under 60 minutes. Get date night rolling before your parents bring him back. How about a living room sip and paint? They'll never know you stole their crayons. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com today. Well, hey, everybody, it's Ed Mann, the executive producer of The Real Brady Bros. And I said my name sort of like it was a surprise to everybody, but it shouldn't be by now. Well, maybe it was a surprise to me. I mean, that would be really weird. This is Q&A number 16. It's our Sweet 16 Q&A. We're so excited to have The Real Brady Bros with us. That's right. You've been asking, asking questions on the Facebook page, at Real Brady Bros. And here they are, Christopher Knight and Barry Williams. You ask and we answer. It's amazing. It's like volleyball. You hit it and it comes back and then I miss it. Yeah, and but everyone laughs. laughs. And that's what we happens. apparently answer sometimes. We've got some good qu- we have some good questions this week. Uh, what are they? I think so. Let's <laughs> cut, cut Chris off at the passway, don't you? <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. Did you have a we comment? To, uh, answered witticism? questions that are completely wrong. Oh, oh no! And now we are developing a reputation in podcast realm. As not having a clue, not to our own, not that we invite histories. criticism, but there it is. It happens. People will occasionally pop I, in. Let's dive in. All right. Yeah. So read the statement of uh, of Robert, the Gen Xer. You right. Know what he says. <laughs> we had a Gen Xer question. <laughs> like that's unique. There was a question that we had never gotten to, and this is something that Rob has been probably waiting for for weeks, and here it is. How accommodating were the HGTV talents? And just to recap, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, there was a great HGTV special about the rebuilding of the uh, renovation of the actual location of the uh, Brady home. That was the exterior shot. And the guys ran in and did the work, along with, I would imagine, workmen, to complete the deal, to make the interior look like it might have looked had that house existed on the program, as opposed to a soundstage. How accommodating were the HGTV talents to each of the Brady's expertise, or lack thereof, when doing renovations? Were there items in the original series that uh, they either could not duplicate or find, and, and what posed the greatest obstacles? Well, I know you you know the obstacles, Chris. I, I do want to say the HGTV were... We were the obstacle terrific with us they they wanted to know what we excelled in they wanted us to participate we were especially handy for the uh, the uh, demolition aspects they let us pull um, eaves of uh, the roof of an eave over out in the backyard and we were we were encouraged to offer ideas thoughts they were very very thorough but we didn't have you know pieces or props or things uh, so much to bring in but we did run into a an enormous and significant obstacle with the horse that is in the living room and very dominant when we're passing through the living room. And Chris Knight saved the day. Well, I had some ideas on what to do about fixing that horse. Uh, and that all proved to be quite interesting by using, uh, you know, modern tools, uh, 3D printing and watch the show. You'll see how it plays out. But the horse was crushed and its legs were no longer solid. I mean, it was on an armature and that was all that was left at the bottom of the legs. And so we had to recreate the legs and fix that horse so that, I mean, the living room wouldn't be complete without that horse sitting on that credenza below the stairs. You know, it was a really interesting project and it was a huge undertaking. And this was, this was more than just a remodel. This was a rebuild. There was a lot of square footage added to make this home duplicate the Brady set. Well, for one reason, yes. uh, Chris, the uh, it was a one-story ranch home and not two-story and it didn't have, so there was no staircase and the configuration was uh, very, very different than we had the lot. They had to work with the lot size itself. It's a small, you know, res- subdivision, re- residential area. And uh, they had to, <laughs> well, virtually double, maybe more than double the square footage. You know, thinking about it, we were quite lucky that Though, uh, you know, I'm very much on record saying I didn't think what they were attempting to do would be able to be accomplished. Because, again, it's a one-story house. 
our set very, very prominently displays this, this giant staircase, clearly a two story house. And how do you, how do you do that without ruining the street Roof elevation, line. which right. is very important because that's the, that is the part of the house that the show actually used the exterior elevation of this particular home. And now to take that, this home and make the interior look like our set, my fear was that you're going to have to destroy the exterior elevation. So you won't have what you're looking for. <laughs> You'll destroy the thing that everybody recognizes, uh, trying to attempt to make it into our set. But they, you know, they were able to accomplish it. They were, they were able to fit it in and then doing it so lovingly and specifically, you know, they weren't trying to do a, um, a modernization of the Brady home. They came in wanting to replicate the Brady home that we all have grown accustomed to. Right, not so much a renovation, and, um, but a replication. They, they've done it, a replication more than, and which is harder when you think about what a renovation, normally a renovation show is. We look at a house that it's in a certain state, and then there's some ideas that are applied, and at the end, those ideas come to fruition, and the house looks different. And improve. But take take for example, this is the kind of specificity. We had uh, rock facades on some of the walls, particularly at the at the entry and and where the horse was. And they would they would build it out with the drywall, and then they would put trace tracing paper on it, and they would overlay it with photographs to size to scale, and then they would draw in the stone shapes of each stone. And then they would replicate those and attach them to the walls to make them look exactly an exact replication. A wonderful professional experience. Not only did we enjoy being together, but everyone on the set wanted to be there. Everyone was excited about making this thing happen and 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 finding the the, the obstacles and then overcoming them. To, there were several months uh, of renovating. I know I went I, living here in the uh, Midwest. I I went out in that year and a half. 14 times and New York eight. So there was a lot of uh, travel around it. And uh, it was a very exciting project to be a part of as well as nostalgic. And they did a terrific job. Yes. Yeah, so what I was driving at is that, you know, most renovations are, are not driven to a particular visual. You're, you're not trying right. to match uh, uh, something that's burned into your brain, but that's what we did in this particular case. So it's much more exacting, m- much more rigorous you're not just trying to improve the property. In our case, we were trying to create the Brady home. My thoughts. They found a, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Barry. Just that they they had found a swatch of carpet from the original bolt that they used uh, at Paramount, and <laughs> I guess there was enough there to, to at the manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. at the manufacturer. Went back to the manufacturer. I mean, yeah, and the manufacturer looked, and they had some. Yeah, and we outsourced a lot. It was it was a great promotional campaign because we reached out to viewers and fans and. And people that, you know, knew what we were, that's how we got the refrigerator. That's how we got the toaster. Uh, The same, these things were donated to us. But now to the question, how much were they, how were they accommodating to us and our particular talents? They did review that with us. Uh, They had their own idea of which rooms they wanted us to work on and formulated the teams that would work on those particular rooms. But let's be frank, this, this was a big undertaking. This Normally should take about two years. I mean, in our case, it took seven months with many, many construction workers working on the property. So as Barry said, he came out to LA, what did you say? Eight times, 12 Mm -hmm. times, whatever. That wouldn't provide enough time for Barry to completely redo the house, even with all of our help. We were all at the property less time than necessary to have affected this change. There was a lot of other people working. Chris wasn't always around when I was supervising some of the renovation, uh, like in the den and and the bathrooms and upstairs bedrooms and building the staircase and the kitchen and finding it for Micah. He was taking days off, but I was there. uh, (laughs) They had, I mean, in the seven months that they were building the house, we and the cameras were there maybe in total 20 days, you know, out of what? 180, 200 days. So you can see there was a lot of construction going on without the cameras being present. Nonetheless, we did contribute, you know, and, 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 and a lot of that contribution was in our recollection of the sets and the space. And as our audience now knows, our recollection isn't always keen. If you saw me holding a sledgehammer and striking a wall, I was contributing. I'd like to see that picture. (laughs) 
Very oh, it's in, it's in there. I'd Sherry, like to see that. What well, wasn't edited Sherry out? Did it all. And then I can imagine the it editing on a project, project like this. The editors must have, you know, oh my gosh, what the, the kind of work that they would have had to do to put all of that together to form a program. It ended up, it ended up having, I think, uh, we ended up having six episodes, uh, more than six, six or eight episodes. Eight. Yeah, it was it just there was a lot that they could uh, mm-hmm. they could sew together to make interesting, uh, fascinating television. Yeah, so yeah. And one of the still one of the highest rated programs on that channel. Moving along, Mark asks a rather tawdry question about a rather tawdry program, in my opinion, the E True Hollywood Story. Now, this is nothing I tend to watch all the time, but hey, here you go. There was a profile, apparently, on the Brady Bunch, and they talked about a plan for you guys, the six of you, to get paid more at some point. How serious did it get? Was there a. Who were they interviewing? I don't I, even I know. Didn't I didn't know that came they did from a profile no idea. on the Brady Bunch. I, no? I have no idea what that's referring to. and. Uh, I don't, and I wonder if it even was involved with the series, the original Brady Bunch show, and not maybe a reunion. Uh, we didn't start negotiating, really playing hardball until after the original show. We didn't have a chance to. We no. all signed five-year deals. Yeah. If the show would have gone into a sixth year, they would have had to come back to us to negotiate what that would have been. Well, and, perhaps the uh, question we circled got, around the plan after the program, that perhaps you guys were looking for something more. You know, like you said, you were locked in for that, that first five. Was there a uh, talk of some kind of holdouts or something of that sort? Never got that far. Never got that far. Well, not, not with us, but there might be other other cast members that were involved in negotiations. And, mm. You know, I wasn't a part of. I wasn't a part of. Right. So. We'll move along. I mean, I, as far as I know, that they never, they, they never. Hey, you'll have to go to the, the Real Brady Girls <laughs> <laughs> podcast. Is that another one the, I have to produce? The real, right. the real Brady gals. All right. Uh, I got my hands full. <laughs> it would have been guys. more expensive. It definitely would have been more expensive for them. It, you to know, do a 60 year. This is like, like football. We were on our rookie deals. Yeah. And um, if the show would have gone into a sixth season, they would have had to then, um, you know, offer us, you know, something quite a bit different than what our rookie deals. Were. What else you got for us, Ed? Well, let's see. It's actually this woman named Janice and she's on the page all the time. And I got to give her credit. Nice. There's no one asks more questions than Janice and they just come fast and furious. And she's just very sweet about it. And I told her, Hey, we can't get to everything, but we did find one. And it's a lovely little question. And it's something I'm sure a lot of people want to know. What do you guys like for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. What are your favorite foods? <sighs> just, I like, Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> Don't even eat lunch. Uh, hardly eat breakfast. So, I mean, I, where am I when I'm eating? I mean, tell me. I mean, where in the world am I? Pose well, you're thinking about me. that. I, I I enjoy omelets a lot. I'm a cereal eater. Um, I also love strong coffee, black, and lunches. My favorite, my kind of go-to is uh, toast, and then I, I spread an avocado on the bottom of it, and oh, then I add... A little protein, whether it's uh, beef or chicken or turkey. And then on top of that, I put a little bit of Munster or provolone cheese and then pop that in the microwave for about 30 seconds and knock myself out. That's all lunch and dinner. Dinner's a light kind of a thing right now. We use a thing called Green Grocer and it's uh, online and it's all these exotic kinds of elements to put together and they're pre-selected, I guess, and they are portion-sized. But then you mix them all together, and you know, wow, here's like gourmet. Chris, what do you what do you eat? But mostly days? vegetarian. I, I I no longer really um, address lunch. Sort of skip it completely. But breakfast is is fruit and coffee. I love my my I like really strong coffee, but I, with a little sweet cream in it. I don't eat as big a breakfast as perhaps I should. In so far as I don't have lunch, and so I lean on di- a dinner to be the main meal of the day. Well, but that's because you're a chef. I like cooking. Yeah, I like cooking, and you're good and at I, it too. I know. I've been over to ha- over to the house, and it's I been a while. Like, I'm hungry. What, what, <laughs> whatever I last had is the thing I least want to have next. Oh, really? I, I mean, I well, like you instantly get tired of what I, you have just eaten. Is what you're saying? No, it? well, no, it doesn't mean I'm tired. It just means well, we've done that one. Let's come around to something new. So yeah, it's it's. I like new things, so mm. I would rarely go to a restaurant and order the same thing. Well, I give us an idea. What uh, I mean of like you don't. I mean you don't just like you know pop in a potato and you know and then bake it. Well, sometimes sometimes we do baked potato, you know, but you get the old fashioned. You get sauces steak, going on and and um, yes, I and, do. And um, you know uh, uh, 
uh, exotic meats sometimes. Like we had some friends over over the weekend and we did a, a barbecue. And so wanted to make it simple because it was a little impromptu. So did burgers and hot dogs. But instead of just regular hot dogs, I we have a market here that, that specializes in, in European meats. So I got all kinds of sausages and hot dogs from the old country you know, with natural casings and rather unique to everybody who was at the party. Cool. And so far, you know, as they're so used to just buying a hot dog. So in short, familiar for, to them. for a good time, <laughs> call Chris Knight. <laughs> I like to explore. My, the kitchen is party. my lab. Yeah. <laughs> if you're looking for European beef, <laughs> hit him up. <laughs> if anybody out there knows where I can get scapes, uh, I would be uh, what's a scape in learning where you here. So there's the uh, garlic scapes or garlic ramps. A little argument as to whether which is which. The top part of the garlic. Oh. When it grows, normally they dry it out, and you'll notice that there's sometimes bindles of, of garlic. Right, they're all woven together. They're woven together from the top part of the garlic. And imagine an onion growing. You know, you have the the sprout that comes out of the middle. Um, that part, when cut off, if still green, and only at that time of year before you dry out your onion or put your onion into into shelter, you could cut it off and eat it. And it's and it's they're wonderful. It's like a really mild kind of garlic. You know, I had them a number of times and can't find them anymore. Well, two things. Uh, two only. things. Mindy and I have to try that first of all. That's just something we have to do. We like to cook here too. The second thing is I never heard of uh, garlics being called uh, groupings of bindles. That, that to me is new and very exciting. You know those, those like Italian, like, a, like they're two <laughs> feet long and there's just garlic clove after garlic clove. In a, it, it looks almost like it's four inches around garlic clove right. woven together. Yeah, okay. I mean, a, 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 a bindle. Just a bunch of, uh, I'm not sure what they call that. Let's move on. Uh, Daniel. Asks the following, um, wondering if Chris or Barry can remember a situation in their lives where they took a lesson on the Brady Bunch to heart, like a, a mic lecture or from someone else on the program. And he says he loves the podcast. Thank you, Daniel. All of them. <laughs> yeah, don't play ball in the house. I mean, that one's that one rings true. I mean, I, that, I mean those were kind of universal things, just fitting the, the circumstance and the situation that we were in. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I, well, let's pose it to Barry. Barry, you've now raised... Uh, a child? Did you use any of Mike's old lectures, uh, you know, as a crutch, or as, a, as, a, as a help of when raising Brandon? Uh, and and do it and do it knowingly, not accident. Actually, I I, w I really wish I had. Um, but you know, I I have um, my daughter is ten, so there's still time. I could you know I could dig up and and look at some Mike Brady lectures, and just you know spring them on her, whether they fit or don't. <laughs> I mean, there was one last week, one last week that I, that literally when watching the show realized this is, this is useful. I mean, and this was when Alice was giving advice to Marsha about, about when is it all right to tell on someone, right? Tells th that information that you have. And I, and that's always been sort of a slippery slope. Well, tell, uh, tell when is it that it's not stitching, uh, snitching? When are you being helpful by, by put, does it hurt the person? Is it good for them? Would they be yeah, better see, off? If you did, then if you didn't. It was a wonderful way of, of uh, making the choice. Cool. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. Universal appeal. You, there's there's a Robert who, you know, another Robert in our question, but he had a statement up front. And this is what I was alluding to when we began our, our oh, Q&A 16 here right. about um, he's loving the podcast. You got Robert up there? Okay. Yeah, Robert. Um, this is the Gen Xer. He chimes in with this. Um, I'm loving the real Brady bros. Loving the Q&As. I have a question that I hope will get answered. Well, guess what? Here, here we are. Uh, many of the well, actors... Wait a second. You're skipping the part You're skipping the part where he says, it's so funny how much the guys don't actually remember or get entirely wrong. Okay. Well, it, it, there it is. seems to be something... You ask the question, so I'm going to go back. <laughs> Where's that European salad that I wanted earlier? I <laughs> Cindy, but it's yeah. a bundle of garlic. We, it's our own lives, I'm, and we get it wrong. I'm <sighs> sorry, that was a long way down the field for no touchdown. Uh. Ooh, telling you that. <sighs> looks like uh, just, love to love. Not cooperating. Many of the actors of the Brady Bunch have made some fantastic cameo appearances over the years, but one of my favorites, according to Robert, and definitely the most uncharacteristic, was uh, Chris Knight and E. Plum playing Mr. and Mrs. Savashan, if I'm pronouncing it right. 
in Greg Araki's 1997 film, Nowhere. They show a <laughs> frantic scene, screaming and speaking faux Swedish, or perhaps Icelandic, as they discover that their heroin-addicted son, Bart, had just committed suicide by asphyxiation <laughs> in the oven after watching a televangelist, played by John Ritter, no less, who encourages suicide in order to reach heaven. Wow, what book was he reading? Doesn't get more on Brady than that. Uh, Chris, can you tell us a bit more about the experience on this film? Yes, Chris, and please do tell us more about that, but do it in an Icelandic accent. Oh, you that would, would be perfect. You. Yeah, uh, Mr. I got to tell you, this, this, I mean, this was something that was that was offered, and um, um, things that was offered. <laughs> <laughs> never had an opportunity to talk. Not a one uh, opportunity <laughs> to, to Greg um, to know exactly what we were doing. Uh, but it was all in this sort of phonetic. But did you um, ever figure it out? It, it wasn't English. It wasn't English at all. So we weren't making words. We were just, it was just, it was just stuff. Oh, we didn't know if it was words or not. But um, oh, my goodness. Oh, I, I think I have Eve to thank because she's, she's actually really good with dialects. And we we found a way through it, doing it as though we spoke whatever that was, Icelandic. And I really, at that point, heard about director uh, Araki and that he was an up-and-coming director, but didn't know much about him. But as an actor, you know, you're always looking for, for something new and different. And certainly this was different. So, you know, we, you know, hearing that he was involved, it was, it was a joy to do. It was one day of work, so there's very little that I have in the memory of, of, of that work in 97. But uh, uh, the movie, you know, got... You know, good notices. Greg has uh, continued, you know, in his uh, his career, becoming uh, you know a, a director of um, of substance. Was this a dark Did comedy you, uh, or was it a serious drama? I mean, what, what really was this? How would you characterize this? A film noir. Film, film noir. Okay. I mean, it was it was an odd, you know, did, um, did funny you... funny in context scene. I mean, it was it, just that. I mean, it's Chris. Did dystopian. you get to work? Did you get to work with uh, John Ritter? No, no. Yes, he was a film. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a, I've, I've, met, I'd met John. Yeah, gone too soon. He was a tremendous talent. Well, guys, that was Sweet Sixteen. That was Q and A number sixteen. What a fabulous Q and A it was! And we'll look back on this one with fond memories. <laughs> we move along to seventeen the following week, and we have more uh, episodic recaps coming on a podcast platform near you for the Real Brady Bros. There they are. It's Barry Williams, Christopher Knights. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.